Hello everybody, today I've got a very special guest. If you're into games composing, the name Richard Jakes will ring lots and lots of bells. He's been around since the mid-90s, he's scored dozens and dozens of iconic games. He worked in-house for Sega, he's done James Bond games, he's done um, Marvel Guardians of the Galaxy games, he's done absolutely everything. And he's a real voice within the games industry. So much so that he is um, the keynote speaker at this year's GameSoundCon, which is an absolutely marvellous occasion. Um, it happens in Los Angeles at the Burbank Convention Centre, and it's probably the premier meeting place for people who are into games, game music and game sound. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can go along in person or indeed online, and I'd heartily recommend it. I'm not being sponsored, I don't get anything out of this, but let's now chat with Richard and get his take on where the industry is right now. Richard Jakes, how nice to see you again. I've, I can't, how long ago did we meet? Must be almost 20 years ago now. Oh, must must be something like that guy. Nice to see you again. Must must be over twenty years. I think I was still in house at Sega back in those days when we first met. You were, you were, but the whole industry has just changed out of all possible recognition in that time. I mean, I was I saw a statistic the other day that four out of every ten people on planet Earth now play games, and almost all those games are going to require sound and music. How, from your perspective, has that really affected things? I mean, this massive behemoth of an industry. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it grow exponentially since the early 90s when I started my career in the games industry. And back in those days, it was still regarded as a slightly sort of geeky hobby for sort of sweaty male students playing in their bedrooms, and things like that. But, um, you know, since the technology has moved on, especially with the handheld and the mobile market, uh, the online presence, um, it's just grown, you know, beyond all recognition, really. And especially amongst, you know, younger gamers, female gamers, the demographic is just so wide. And there's, you know, people like me that have been gaming since I was, you know, a kid and um, st still am today, sort of 40 years later. So what are the trends? What are the trends in terms of music and games? Um, you know, are, are there things you can discern which are different now than say they were 10 years ago? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you know, now we've got such amazing tools that we can uh, can utilize. And back in the day when I first started, it was, um, you know, a, a very hard slog to kind of get get the technology to do what we wanted it to do. So the the creative opportunities have expanded just so much since since having great technology. You know, we've got almost unlimited channels to play with. I've, I've never run out of channels uh, in the last five years. Um, you know, we don't have to worry about um, RAM limitations quite as much. Obviously, there's always going to be a boundary, but we don't have to worry quite as much. Um, but from a creative standpoint, um, it means that we can, you know, literally the sky's the limit. We can we can think of a concept for a, for a score or for a sound um, and actually deliver that without having to, to worry about cutting things down and cutting corners quite so much. So it, it's really revolutionized, you know, what we can do creatively. And I, you know, I'm, I, I have to think, um, you know, I don't have to worry about the tech so much now. I can just think on a purely creative level of what I'm trying to achieve on a score. So it's um, really sort of uh, liberating in that sense. When I first spoke to um, the great Tommy Tallarico many, many, many years ago, I mean, that was back in the day when most game scores were a pale pastiche of a movie score. You know, it was all make it sound like The Matrix, make it sound like Gladiator. But, I mean, today that could not be further from the truth. If anything, the opposite is now true. And games are the ones who are pushing forward creatively, finding new sounds, new ways of telling stories. Is music more and more important in the storytelling, not just the interactivity, but the storytelling and the whole immersive experience? Absolutely, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, for myself, I'm definitely a sort of um, narrative driven composer, if you like, because those are the franchises that I tend to, to work on and focus on these days, whether it's based on a movie franchise, or whether it's a, um, a brand new IP. And I think that has changed the way that I plan a score and, and um, you know, how I'm going to approach it. So for example, I want the game to sound like the game, not anything else. You know, I, I start by getting sound palettes together and sort of musical ideas because I want it to sound unique and I want those ideas to follow the, the story arc um, through the narrative of the game. And that's really important, I think, to give an overall experience because as composers, we're thinking that, you know, this could be a 40, 60, 80 hour gameplay time. So how are we going to, you know, cover those bases, but still keep um, in touch with the story and the characters and the narrative, whether it's through 
themes or idioms or you know tonalities or however we're going to approach it i think that's really important to take a, a big high level look before actually getting down to the writing so that's something i really enjoy doing is is looking at the narrative and i work very closely with all the narrative designers and um yeah it, it's um definitely different to uh, to how it was back in the day it's interesting you talk about themes and things like that because when you're talking about 80 hours of um, gameplay, what a number of games composers have said to me, you have to be really careful about your melodic ideas because if it's coming up every 20 seconds, you know, but by, by the time you know, poor old Zelda has got halfway out the, the first cave, you're going to be fed up and want to sort of give up and go away. Is, is that something you're super aware of when you're scoring a game? Absolutely. I mean, I never want to sort of hit the player over the head with themes and, you know, not every game needs needs themes. Sometimes a different approach is needed. But but where I do use themes, um, I tend to limit myself to around five or possibly six um, sort of main themes. You know, you have maybe a main theme for the game and then some for characters or specific settings, um, because I believe anything more than that just dilutes the others. So a good theme has to have legs. You know, it has to have a lot of um, um, scope to, to be reused and reworked. And I think um, as long as you've got that, that the basis of that from the get-go, then um, that material will provide you with, with a lot of um, longevity throughout the scoring process. So I take it very seriously, and themes are the first sort of things I do in my process. Um, I always write the main theme for the game as as part of the pitching process and things like that. So yes, it's it's a fine balance between creating enough material that will that will give you um, the longevity of the score without bashing the player over the head and you know we're going to be using underscores and cinematics and things like that as well different devices so um yeah i say to the um students often you know in you know star wars episode four there were three basic themes there was the you know the the, the goodies the baddies and the love theme i mean details spared but that <laughs> that that worked really well so when clients say to me oh i want a theme for every single character if you overdo it too many themes means nobody remembers anything so exactly right i mean it does get to saturation point i think um you know sort of a less ex less experienced audio lead or um audio director may want that approach and i understand why but once i explain that you know if you've got a cast of let's say 20 characters you know five lead characters and then people you meet along the way and then a cast of maybe 50 npcs or whoever um giving them the theme of their own just just would be counterproductive because as you said quite rightly no one would remember anything and it would less have less impact for the player when we do bring those themes in um so yeah i try and steer people away from that approach now, you, you wrote a really thoughtful comment on a video I did a little while ago, which was, I was just doing the basic kind of nuts and bolts of horizontal, vertical, you know, uh, interactivity and all the rest of it. And you were saying, yeah, but you've got to know when to use it. This isn't just a toolbox which you roll out just because you can make an interactive musical, you know, um, event doesn't mean you should. How do you make that decision? <laughs> It's a really good question, and it's a it's a really fascinating discussion point. Um, yes, yeah, certainly I wasn't being um, derogatory. It, it, what I enjoyed about that discussion is that, you know, back in the day, let's say 10, 15 years ago, when we first started to get decent middleware tools, you know, we were all doing, oh, uh, this is the stealth, this is the action, blah, 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 stingers here and there. And it was a kind of de facto smorgasbord of, of cues that we would sort of serve up. Um, but then a long time ago, I started thinking, well, that's not particularly appropriate for every single game because we don't know how quickly we're going to be changing from stealth to combat and back again, etc. So I sort of started thinking in a slightly different way about an overall, whether it's a mission or a level or a particular area within the game, you know, what musically is going to tie that together and then working within the parameters. Okay, so if we are going to have, let's say, stealth and combat, how are we going to move between them? Because sometimes, as a gamer, I find it distracting and a bit um, sort of, I don't know, sort of presumptuous that just because we're moving stealthily and then we're going into a combat situation, the music changes and then goes back. Now, we can say, well, it's good that it does that because it's then uh, reacting to what the player is doing. But nowadays, because I've been there and done that, I'm trying to take a, a much more high level approach thinking, well, we're starting from point A and we get to point H or whatever. And in between them, we've got stealthy parts. We've got action gameplay. We've got some stingers. We've got some cinematics, things like that. What's the overall musical thing we want to say for that entire 
mission or a specific level or area of the, of the map and things like that. So I think that's made me sort of change my approach a bit. But, you know, I'm still remembering those things, but I, I don't like playing games where the change is just so quick and it's so automatic that it actually takes away from the impact. So I sort of started to think, well, what do we want to do musically? And because impact for, for combat doesn't automatically mean you know fast tempo big drums things like yeah. that it, yeah. from an aesthetic point of view it can mean anything it could be string clusters it could be whatever it is the composer wants to do so it's a really interesting point i, I think that the basics of that are, are are true and and it's a good way of teaching composers new to the genre that we can do these things you know we can go from stealth to combat and back again in a seamless and musical way and i think that's a really good background to have but then I, i'm sort of encouraging composers to think about okay just because we can do that should we in this particular setting some points it might be completely relevant but some points it might need a completely different approach so it's a really interesting way of sort of how are we attacking these these sort of problems and how are we going to solve them to make um you know the smooth gameplay that we're all looking to do and the transitions that we're all looking to make smooth but on an overall high level creative point standpoint um i'm sort of looking at things differently um i i like using a lot of sort of proximity loops and things like that to build tension and, and just just using the technology that we now have available but but thinking yeah like you said you know just because we can does it mean we should yeah, yeah question yeah. mark i mean this is actually there's a direct parallel in in scoring particularly animation where i spent quite a lot of time which is uh, you know where people want you to be to really close sync to the picture all the time and that often, what you're doing by doing that is you're almost reducing the, the music to a two-dimensional thing, which is literally reflecting what's going on on the screen. Whereas, you know, what Hitchcock said is, if the, you know, if the music and the picture are doing the same thing, then one of them's redundant. And so getting people, just because you can sync to picture and you can hit that hit point, doesn't mean you should, because actually when you're doing that, you're actually reducing the language the narrative power of the music and that's really exactly what you're saying in terms of games absolutely right i would agree with that 100 percent um you know for example if you have uh six segments of stealth combat stealth combat stealth combat maybe an end boss you know you could just one example you could build through the six segments and then drop completely down for the end boss um you could do it the other way you could there's a there's a myriad ways of doing it but i think if if we can all think about what we're trying to achieve creatively rather than just tick the boxes of interactive music and, and the game engine reacting to what the player is doing then i think that provides a richer experience and um i agree with the the, the sentiment that you know if there is a, a big heavy combat scene with lots of things happening on screen or or a strong narrative point you know sometimes it's better not to do the most obvious thing but try a different approach and that's something that i've definitely been working on myself in the last sort of 10 to 15 years um there was one example in the um james bond game i scored um bloodstone where um there was a huge cavern sequence and you could hear screams behind this door right at the end and it was set in the catacombs and you had to go through about three really large rooms and i wanted to continually build the tension but there were small skirmishes of gunfight with about two or three enemies before you reach this end door so i thought the the best thing for that particular scene the thing that i thought worked the best is to actually treat it as one long queue where you're constantly building tension until you get to this door, which then triggers a, um, a cinematic sequence. Um, and then I was able to interactively just bring in a few more layers for these interim skirmishes. So the way I sort of did that was to continually introduce layers in a in a sort of um, slightly bitonal way, sort of half diminished feel, which then you could trigger at any one point, depending on where you were in the map, and just kept building this sort of cacophony. And when it when it when you actually the player actually reached the door at the end of the catacomb, it was you know pretty terrifying the um, the the feeling you built up over those kind of eight to ten minutes of gameplay. So you know little tricks like that, um, I think we can all learn along the way. And then if it's appropriate for for the next project, then um, these are good things to try out. I definitely went down the wrong road when I went into film and television. I should have gone into games. It's, it's so much more fun. No, it's not more fun. Sorry, plans. <laughs> I love writing. <laughs> no, and it's true. But there is this kind of enormous you know, opportunity in nonlinear media, which you know, is in, in many respects creatively, people are only really just starting to stretch their legs and, and explore. Um, something which is celebrated at um, an amazing conference which takes place in um, Los Angeles called um, Game Sound Con. I've been there myself a few years ago before the pandemic heard some incredible speakers and there's an incredible speaker this year 
it's you. So, <laughs> so you're going to be explaining this in much greater depth, presumably, to the lucky people who are going to be at Game Sound Con. Yes, that's right. I've been um, kindly asked to deliver the keynote speech at Game Sound Con. So I'm going to be talking about my sort of almost 30 year career in games, everything from the early tech, the early wasn't even middleware really, but the early sort of systems that I had to use and the sort of discipline it taught me as a composer, um, all the way through to sort of improving pitching and things like that, um, credits, um, orchestral recording, interactive composition techniques, um, the whole the whole shebang really. So 30 years worth of uh, comment and hopefully it'll be quite, quite fun and um, keep it low key and um, there should be some amusing anecdotes in, in there as well for the attendees. <laughs> It's a wonderful occasion. You can go either online or uh, in person. Um, tickets are available now. Details are below this. Um, um, I'm a big fan of Game Sound Con. This is not sponsored. They're not paying me just to say this. I just like it, okay? Also, I really, really appreciate the survey that you do quite regularly, which gives us a really interesting breakdown of what people are earning and the demographic of the industry, how many um, women there are now in the industry and things like this. So they're a real force for good. So I'm delighted that you're going to be there. And uh, it's, a, it's a really nice place. I mean, you meet all kinds of people at these events, don't you? And in a way which you're just not going to if you sit in your room and um, Zoom people all, time, all day long. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such a great conference because it's it's all game audio people. You know, it's not, it's not like some of the other big conferences where you do have all the amazing artists and designers as well. But this is purely game audio, so it, it's it's your entire peer group. And I always love learning so much from just talking to people, um, you know, in the corridors and having discussions after a panel. So it's something I really enjoy, and I think the uh, the industry learns so much when they come together and exchange these these um, kind of ideas and and experiences um especially face to face now that we can yeah. do so and i agree with you the the uh, the survey is really really important because the only one to my knowledge that exists in the industry and even yesterday i was having coffee with an audio director when we were discussing this and that's the only real thing he can base his kind of salary requirements on when he's hiring his staff so um it's a really good benchmark and i encourage everyone to take part in it and as you said it, it, it's a good a good sort of barometer of where we are as an industry with representation um, uh, across the board with, um, you know, freelancers versus in-house versus um, mobile games versus AAA, the kind of budgets that are involved, things like that. It's a really valuable piece of information. So I definitely welcome it. Brilliant. Well, Richard, I'm greatly looking forward to your keynote. Um, I will be there, albeit remotely. And I'm Heartily encourage um, all those of you who can to attend in person or, or online if you're interested in uh, music and audio for uh, games because it is absolutely, it's an education. It's really, really wonderful. So, uh, Richard, thank you so much indeed for your time. Have a good have Thanks, Guy. Uh, you won't be attending remotely, I presume. You're going to be there in person in, uh, I'll be there in, in good person. old Los Angeles. Absolutely. Well, Richard, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed. If this is the kind of thing you enjoy, remember to subscribe and uh, we can can uh, meet up again sometime very soon. In the meanwhile, from me and Richard, cheerio.